much from Dr. Michael Naughton. He is our next speaker. He also is the holder of the Koch Endowed Chair in Catholic Studies at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, where he is a full professor in the Department of Catholic Studies. He is the director of the Center for Catholic Studies, which is the oldest and largest Catholic Studies program in the world. He's also the author and editor of nine books and over 40 articles. He helped coordinate and write the Vocation of the Business Leader, issued by the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace in 2012. And his latest work, titled Respect in Action, Applying Subsidiarity in Business, seeks to restore the person to a proper central concern in organizational design. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Naughton. It's indeed a great honor to be here, and this is such a wonderful community. Um, Bishop, uh, I would imagine you find to be in such a community to be quite an honor. Um, I've always been taken by uh, the school, uh, the work Joe Rutten and his team has been doing, and of course we uh, have the great honor to receive many of your students at St. Thomas in the Center for Catholic Studies, and Sioux Falls is quite well known at the university and in Catholic studies. So thank you for all the work uh, and the wonderful culture that you've created in Sioux Falls to produce such wonderful young people. This afternoon, I'd like to share with you some of the contents of the document that you have in front of you called The Vocation of the Business Leader, which was produced by the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. Um, I was a part of the um, team that crafted uh, the document, although I, I do have to say right off the bat, that I want to give a special thanks uh, to Andreas Widmer, um, who was uh, very critical to the writing of the document because I gave him a draft and he was extremely generous. And what he was able to do uh, that really helped the document is actually change the tone of the document. Uh, and, and Andreas, I just can't tell you how grateful I am for the work that you did in the document. Uh, while his name is not on there, it probably should be on there. Uh, there were a lot of people who were involved in writing the document. The document takes on a, um, a very simple method of seeing, of judging, and acting. And what I'd like to do uh, today is to focus on the question of the particular last section on acting, although I'll be taking um, uh, insights from throughout the document. And the reason why is that it seems to me that this topic of vocation and this idea of living an integrated life is critical to how we understand the nature of our work. Think about it. Everyone in this room has a view of work. Sometimes we may not be always terribly articulate, but if you think about the stories of your lives and where you came from, those stories inform about how we understand the work that we do. Some of those stories are great stories. I suspect for many reasons, the reasons why you're sitting in the chair today is you have great stories to tell. But all of us, because of our fallen condition, have stories that actually, rather than reveal, they often conceal what we're actually doing. I remember, I, I grew up in the south of Chicago. Uh, both my parents are from Ireland, Irish immigrants. And it was a difficult time in the 60s and 70s. And I was walking out the door one day, and my father looked at me and says, Michael, Michael, you'd be a good boy, Michael. I said, sure, Dad, whatever. And before I can take another step, he looked at me and says, but Michael, Michael, if you can't be good, you be careful. <laughs> I said, all right, I'll try that. Well, an unfortunate event happened to me that night. And my father had to pick me up from a Chicago police station. I'll spare you the details about why. But he walked in the police station, he looked at me and says, Michael, Michael, I think it better just be good. <laughs> now, I tell that story because we tend to live in a culture that gets rather fixated on being careful. So we have designated drivers, safe and careful drivers, who take home drunk and stupid friends. We have a thing called safe sex, somehow thinking that non-productive, disease-free sex will make up for its procreative and unitive dimension. We have an educational system that constantly drives into our children to get the right grades, to get the right scores, to get to the next place, and we've driven the love of learning out of our children. And 
we all have these things called career strategies about how we can get from the next step to the next step, and yet we sometimes lose sight of what does it mean to have good work. This distraction is, I think, a serious problem. And in much it has to do with the whole idea of not living an integrative life, actually living a life that is too often divided. And this was a major theme within this document. At the beginning of the document, it talks about the problem of the divided life. And this is what it says. It says, dividing the demands of one's faith from one's work in business is a fundamental error that contributes to much of the damage done by business in our world today, including overwork to the detriment of the family or spiritual life, an unhealthy attachment to power to the detriment of one's own good, and the abuse of economic power in order to make even greater economic gains. This problem of the divide life is found right in scripture. If you've not had a chance to look at a very interesting book that just came out last year by David Brooks called The Road to Character, it's a very interesting book. And in the beginning of the book, he talks about a man named Joseph Soloveitchik, a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, who wrote a book called The Lonely Man of Faith. And he talks about that in the Bible, in the beginning of Genesis, we not only have one creation story, we have two. And he talks about this as Adam 1, Creation story number one, Adam two, creation story number two. And if you look at the two creation stories in Genesis, the first one, Adam one, is about man the maker. We are to have, we are to subdue and have dominion over the earth. There is in our DNA this capacity to make things. As entrepreneurs, as business people, as whatever it may be, we want to make things. But that does not exhaust who we are. In Adam 2, as he says, it is man the receptor, man the receiver. And there is in the inhumanity this ability or, or this desire that we need to receive things, the more contemplative man. And what Brooks points out is that too often in our culture, Adam 1 alienates Adam 2. And that is what often causes the divided life. So if we are to avoid this divided life, this domination of Adam 1, we have to ask ourselves some very big questions. And this afternoon, I want to ask three questions. The first one is, well, what am I working for? Because you and I work way too much to deprive ourselves of a good answer to that question. But an answer to that question will not only come from the quest this question, which is why we have to ask ourselves a second question. And it's a more difficult question, and it's an odd question. What am I resting in? Because what the book of Genesis tells us is that we are not only made to work, we are also made to rest. St. Augustine talks about it in terms of this way. First page of the Confessions, he says, Our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O God. And when we can put these two questions together, by the way, not in some balanced format, but rather in an integrative way, and the key word here is integration that we want to focus on in this whole conference. We can get to the third question, what am I living for? Now, I don't know what it is about an academic like myself, but if we don't get it into a matrix somehow, somehow we don't think if we feel like we're not doing our job. Now, let me be very clear about this. This is simply a diagnostic tool. I want to use this as a tool. It doesn't explain all of reality. It can't, we're way too complex to be put in boxes. But as you'll see, I hope it's a teaching tool to help you follow what I'm about to say in the next 30 or 40 minutes. Academics also like a thesis, and here's the thesis of my talk. If you and I don't get leisure right, if you and I don't know how to rest right, we'll never get work right, and we'll never get business right. All right, that's the thesis. You might want to challenge me on that thesis, but that's what we'll do. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start right down here, and I'm going to give you three views about how people look at their work, how they look at their leisure, and how they put it together. Okay? That's what we'll do in the next maybe 30 minutes or so. So, first view. Some people look at their work as a job. 
I mentioned to you I grew up on the south side of Chicago, and of my friends uh, there knew I was here talking to you about work or business as a vocation, they'll say, you know what, Mike, you've been in the ivory tower too long. It's about the money. Don't try to get more out of work than it can give. If you've ever been to Minneapolis, there's a little diner called Al's Diner. And in the diner, in the kitchen, it says, there's no fulfillment here, right? There's no, right? So let's get off this idea that somehow it's a job. Don't try to get more out of it than it can give. Or most likely, you could follow, quote a fellow Chicago, and some of you remember him, a columnist, Mike Royko, who said this. He says, if work is so great, how come they have to pay us to do it? Come on, let's get real. But by the way, this is not just a blue-collar phenomenon. This is increasingly a business phenomenon. We see it in the law. We even see it in the healthcare industry, that everything gets reduced down to a price. I, we teach economics and finance. Think about it. Most economics textbooks, the first chapter is about how we're all utility, self-interested utility maximizers. In the first chapter of a finance textbook, it says the purpose of business is simply to maximize shareholder value. It's simply about the price. This is a serious problem. And for leaders, it often doesn't take the form of just being about money, but leaders simply become technocrats or bureaucrats. Another common management little slogan that goes like this, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And thus, all the managers that all people do in terms of their leadership is they just simply try to measure things. And thus, real judgment, particularly moral judgment, and such as the virtues, such as love, such as faith, simply get discounted or marginalized in a particular kind of way. So some people look at their work as a job. Why do they look at their work as a job? There's lots of reasons. But I think a lot of it has to do with how they look at their leisure particularly their leisure as an amusement. We live in a culture that focuses on leisure as in terms of the entertainment. The highest paid people in our culture often are entertainers, although we have plenty of starving artists out there. But the way we think of our leisure our, as an amusement, I think is best captured by that songwriter, Billy Joel, in a song he called The Piano Man. And he says, they know it's been me, they've been coming to see, to forget about life for a while. Leisure is escape. Or a French philosopher put it this way, Jacques Rouleau, and he said, instead of being the moment when we rediscover ourselves, thinking about who we ought to be, leisure is the moment when amusements succeed to the maximum in making us forget. Look at the word amusement. Etymologies are fascinating. The word comes from the Greek word muses. The muses were the goddesses of the, of the liberal arts. They were meant to refresh us, to recreate us, to help us to see a larger horizon. Well, if you put the word a uh, in front of a word, it negates it. If I'm a theist, I believe in God. If I put an a, uh, an atheist, I don't believe in God. In the English, in the Oxford English Dictionary, it's about definition number four for amusement. It's this to stare stupidly at something. <laughs> this is my wife's description of me watching television, right? right? This is how we often see our amusement. And our whole advertisement industry has been captured on this. I was in Chicago a couple years ago and there was a chain of hotels. And the caption for the hotels was this, the weekend getaway, your body checks in and your mind checks out. We see this in all sorts of slogans. Las Vegas, right? Whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Now, whoever said that should get sued for libel because the only thing that stays in Vegas is your money. Everything else comes right with you, right? You don't leave it there. It comes right with you. We're not built that way. But this idea of the weekend of escape has also impacted the whole idea of the way we understand celebrations in itself and thus the commercialization of Christmas, the trivialization of Easter, the utter decadence of Mardi Gras and St. Patrick's Day, the ghoulishness of Halloween. All of these days, which were what? Holy days, holidays, days in which to help us see a larger horizon, have been increasingly become acts of consumption. So what does that tell us? It tells us that when I look at my work as a job, 
and my leisure as an amusement, often life is simply about gratifications. The church has talked about this in terms of consumerism. We're more concerned about what we have and less concerned about what we have become. Pope Francis has been quite keen on this because he says that too often our consumeristic culture fixates us on pleasures, it blunts our conscience, and thus we no longer have room for the poor, for others, for God, and thus it causes a serious set of problems. So, view number one. That view, if you think about it for one moment, is actually unsustainable, because here's what happens. What happens is when people look at their leisure as amusement, they actually start to work more, which men, means they have less time for amusement. It's a woman named Juliet Church. She's an economist. She wrote a book called The Overworked American, and she talks about the work and spend cycle. We are working far more than we've ever worked before, largely because we want to afford the kind of lifestyle that we often have in our leisure. So view number one. View number two. Some people look at their work as a career. And here, we, in a sense, like our work. I love my work. I love getting up and going to work. There's a certain degree of psychological reward. There's a man who wrote this book called Flow, and he talks about the kind of zone or flow that often we have when we go to work. Because I have these talents and these abilities, and there's a task to be done, and there's a flow of these tasks that moves into, that, into those, those tasks, and there's a great sense of achievement and the control and of competence. And thus, we like often the work that we do. But it's interesting, look at the word career. Again, the etymology. It comes from the word that we get, the word car, the automobile, the self-driven vehicle. And thus, what often happens is that often our careers are often about ourselves. And we've lost sight of anything about anything larger than ourselves. And thus, the leader is often seen as goal-oriented. Often, the leader is a careerist. They're not necessarily money-mad, but they are, in a sense, goal-oriented. And they have this deep desire to achieve things. Now, why is that? Again, lots of reasons. But I actually think it has a lot to do with how we look at our leisure. And increasingly, we look at our leisure as utility. Let me give you two examples of this. First is education, where I come from. Education is increasingly justified based on its instrumental value to career. So my students will say to me, like, like Dr. Norton, like, like why do I got to take theology? Right? Like, like what is philosophy going to do for my career? And thus, they have this deep sense that whatever they do, it has to be instrumental to the career. What I try to explain to my students is actually the word leisure, its etymology, comes from the same word that we get the word scola, which means school. You are at leisure, I tell them. And they look at me and they say, you are crazy. This ain't leisure, right? So this idea, but in the tradition, in the Catholic tradition, which is the great tradition of education, that's where the university started in the Middle Ages, out of the church, ex corde ecclesiae, was the whole idea that education was an attempt to help us see a much larger reality. That's what the liberal arts are about, the arts that free us. Or just take the idea, so that's view number one. View number two is often the way we even look at the word rest. And we often see rest as to be justified in order to sharpen the sore, in order to become more productive. Many of you probably remember Stephen Covey's little book, uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, a very good book, by the way. Lots of great wisdom in that book. But this habit that he has of sharpening the saw, I don't think he got quite right. And here's why. When we do things such as to, lead, to rest, to, in order to, in a sense, work more, we often undermine rest. There's a Hungarian psychologist, Sandor Ferenze, who coined the term Sunday neurotic. And he asked the question, why do so many of his clients have this deep sense of angst, of boredom, of unease, of kind of a meaninglessness, a kind of a low-grade depression? Why does it tend to happen 
on Sundays? Now, the obvious answer would be, well, because they have to go back to work on Monday. And he said, no. These are people who try to rest, and they don't know how to rest. And they've gotten themselves into knots. When you do things for the wrong reason, you might do the right deed, as T.S. Eliot says, but if you do it for the wrong reason, it actually becomes a treason. Some things we have to do for the right reason. And thus, what happens? When I look at my work as a career, and I look at my leisure as that which will be instrumental to that career, which actually everything's done to enhance that career, I often see my life as a series of achievements. And here the church talks about the problem of careerism. I'm more concerned about what I've achieved, what I've done, and less concerned about what I have become in the doing. And thus, as Americans, and there's a lot of great things about America, and there's a lot of great things about being American, but sometimes we tend to get overly fixated on our achievements. Matter of fact, we'll excuse a lot of behaviors because of particular achievements. Let me give you a small case of this. You remember a man named Lee Iacocca, former CEO of the Chrysler Corporation, turned the Chrysler Corporation around in 1980s. When, when Iacocca retired from the Chrysler Corporation, he was on the front cover of Fortune magazine a couple of years later with this caption, how I flunked retirement. Here is a man who is an icon of American industry, who knew who he was as CEO, but once he got out of that position, he was lost. He says in the article, by the way, his three years of retirement have been more stressful, stressful than his 47 years in the auto industry. That's an extraordinary thing. One can only admire Iacocca that he'd be that honest about it. But this, in this document, the, voc the vocation of the business leader, and this is, this is a key insight in the Catholic social tradition on work, is that you and I have to change things out there. And we'll get rewarded, and we'll get evaluated, and we'll get all sorts of, all sorts of, all sorts of uh, 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 thoughts on it. But what happens simultaneously, we change things in here. And we're sometimes not as always insightful about what those changes are occurring in here. And that's what the Pope, John Paul II, called the subjective dimension of work. So what does that tell us? It tells us that we actually have a problem. That often the way we look at our work and the way we look at our leisure and the way we put it together is a serious issue that causes what we talked about already, the divided life. So then the question is, well, what is the right way to begin to look at it? And so let me highlight a few of those thoughts. It seems to me, as this document points out, that work is about a vocation. The word vocation, Again, its uh, um, word comes from the word vocare, which means to call. And there are three calls that we have as human beings. The first call is to be human. In Lumen Gentium in Vatican II, it talks about the universal call to holiness, the universal call to love. Or in that document, Gaudium et Spes, and it says this, a person cannot find, fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. Here's the key insight, and this comes right out of a, a very interesting article that Cardinal Ratzinger wrote in 1967. And he said this, he said, only he who can give himself creates the future. This is an extraordinary thing for family, but it is also an extraordinary thing for family businesses and also for entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are people who think they can give of themselves because they think there's a future to be had. If I don't think there's a future to be had, it's hard to give of myself. First call, and we are all called to this. Second call is to a state of life. In the Catholic tradition, we traditionally talk about three states of life. The lay state, the, mer the religious state, and the priestly state. And many of us in the room are in the lay state, and many of us are also have families. And once a colleague said to me, he said this, he said, my wife only has one husband, and my children only have one father. My students have a lot of teachers. That vocation can never be sacrificed to the vocation of a business. 
and thus it has a great claim on us. And yet, even with that said, we are nonetheless still called to work. And the, this is what the document says, we are called to a particular way of working. And the document says this, a business joins together people's gifts, talents, energies, and skills to serve the needs of others. This in turn supports the development of the people who do the work. That is, there is a logic of gift to our work. And this is critical to the understanding of vocation. Before I get into the Catholic and particularly the document of this, I know that I sit within uh, the Native American arena being certainly here in Sioux Falls. And it is a tradition while there's many parts of the culture that's certainly been difficult. It's a very interesting, we can learn a lot of lessons from the Native Americans. And here's an interesting one. You remember the old story when the Puritans came to this country and they met the Native Americans and they exchanged gifts and then they went away and when they came back, what did the Native Americans do? They asked for the gift back, which is where we get the term Indian givers. Now we see that as a very derogatory term. But what we failed to understand was something deep within the Native American culture, that gifts are not meant for you to hoard. Gifts are meant to be given. They are meant to be in motion. And when they saw the white people hoarding their gifts, they wanted it back, not so much for themselves, but to give it to others. God has given each person in this room gifts. If you use those gifts only for yourself, they will corrupt you. It is the law of the gift. The only way they develop you is when they're used for other people. And this becomes the heart of what a vocation is about. So in the document, it talks about for the business. What does that mean for the business, for the organization? And it talks about why, how does a business give itself? Well, what it does is it creates three fundamental goods. It creates services that truly, it creates good goods. Right? Those goods and products that serve other people. It also creates good work, fostering the dignity of work by helping coworkers develop their gifts and talents. And it also talks about good wealth, creating sustainable wealth so that it can be distributed justly. When a business begins to create these types of goods, it is an organization, it is an institution that begins to give itself to the world that we have. We could spend a lot more time talking about that. But I want to, at this moment, highlight a problem, particularly for the leader and particularly for the business person. Or at least, let me put it this way. It's not only just their problem, it's actually my problem. Because when I go to work, I give of myself 110%. And yet, something starts to happen. It's what I would call victimization. I often say, well, why aren't the others working as hard as I am? I even do this with my spouse. I say, why am I giving 60% and she's only giving 40? By the way, I don't say that to my wife. I just think it, right? <laughs> right? I've learned the hard way on that one, right? And so this idea starts to start to happen. And then all of a sudden, a certain kind of resentment starts to seep in. And then the cynicism starts to kick in. And this idea of my giving, which was supposed to be, and it looks really good, but actually the giving starts to turn on me. And I say that because it, it presents a particular problem, which is best captured in a Latin aphorism that goes like this, nemo dot quad non hobbit. You cannot give what you do not have. And if all you do is work, you'll exhaust yourself. And the exhaustion will always find itself in victimization, resentment, and cynicism. And that is why we always have to have leisure in our lives. Not leisure as amusement, not leisure as utility, but leisure as contemplation. And in the, vat, in the vocation of the business leader document, it says this. It says, the first act of the Christian business leader, as of all Christians, is to receive more specifically, to receive what God has done for him or her. This actually can be some of the most, most difficult act of the business person, is to stop long enough to receive. 
Again, Benedict XVI has a great line. He says, the person comes to the most profound sense of themselves, not by what they achieve, but by what they accept, by what they receive. So what does that receiving begin to look like? In the document, it talks about three habits of leisure, of resting, of receiving. The first one is the habit of solitude on a daily basis. And by the way, the question of silence. Not just silence out there, but silence in here. I'm not quite sure about you, but I got all these, I call them emotional tapes going on my head all the time, right? I'm the unappreciated genius at St. Thomas. If they would just listen to me, right? By the way, I walk to school, I have about a two mile walk, and I have debates with my colleagues in my head on the way. I win every debate. I never lost a debate, right? And so all these tapes, and they're not always bad, but the question is, who's going to give me rest? Who's going to give me rest for myself? Because all those tapes prevent me from hearing what God wants me to hear. Jesus' wonderful line, come to me all you who are labor and are burden, and I will give you rest. But I got to shut this darn tape off, which is why the silence and why prayer is so critically important. The second habit, the habit of celebration, of Sabbath and feast. I was quite taken by the gospel today, and Father hit it right on the nail. It was very interesting, right? The businessman was invited to the feast, and what did he do? He went to his business. This, I think, we have to reclaim the Lord's Day. By the way, it's one of the big ten. I often say, if I tried, you know, the Sabbath, you know, keep hold of the Sabbath like I would try, like, like adultery. You know, I, I, honey, I tried adultery this week. It didn't quite work. I'll try it next week, right? I'd be in big trouble. But somehow we think we can do that to the Sabbath. This is why we need to look to the Jews. They often do a much better job at us. By the way, here's, here's an here's, here's experiment. Try this. Try to become a techno sabbatarian I love that phrase. That is, give your technology a rest. Put it away and see how long it can happen. And if you can't, you're addicted to it. It's called internet anxiety disorder. It's a brand new term that psychologists are talking about. We have to give our work a rest, we have to give our consumption a rest, and we even have to give our technology a rest. The Sabbath, I think, is a critical uh, reclaiming for all of us. And lastly, the habit of service, of going to the margins. We cannot do this without, in a sense, engaging the poor. Jean Vanier, who started a large community, once said, we have to get beyond the idea that we're going to simply do things for the poor. And we have to learn to be with the poor. And once we can be with the poor, they will give us things that no one else can give us. Let me highlight these three habits and a story with Mother Teresa. I met Mother Teresa twice in my life. Uh, and once was in Calcutta, India. I was giving a talk at the Indian Institute of Management. And my host was Hindu, and he knew I was Catholic. And he says, you want to go meet Mother Teresa? I said, sure. And so we went down, to, got into a cab, went down to the mother house. We walked in, and there was Mother Teresa. And my Hindu friend drops to his knees, and he's trying to kiss Mother Teresa's feet. And Mother Teresa's trying to pick him up, and he's trying to kiss the feet. There's a wrestling match going on in front of me. And honest to goodness, I sat there, and the only thought that came to my mind was, man, she has big feet. <laughs> and God, is she short. And boy, is she old. And aren't you an idiot that you can't think of something more profound? I'm sitting in the icon of holiness. And all I could think about were feet. Well, we had about a 20-minute conversation. She was delightful. She asked us questions. We asked her questions. And as we were leaving, she says, I want to give you my business card. Right? And there was no telephone number or address. But this is what was on her so-called business card. The fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of faith is love, the fruit of love is service, and the fruit of service is peace. We may sometimes think of Mother Teresa as a nice little old nun who did good work. This woman had operations over 90 countries. She was a very busy woman. But she started each day not with what she wanted, not with her agenda, but in a deep silence of deep prayer of saying, God, what do you want of me in this day? 
So what does that tell us? If we can look at our work as a vocation and our leisure as, as a contemplation, in the deepest sense of the way of prayer, of liturgy, of Sabbath, of serving the poor, then we have the ingredients for real integrity. Again, the word integrity, the Latin word, comes from the word integritas. It's where we get the word integer, to become a whole number, to become whole. And thus we become leaders with integrity. And we become what we call contemplative practitioners. You are not just practitioners. If you were, you're just doers. You're just the Nike, just do it. And then you become highly utilitarian. You are called to be contemplative practitioners, where you are called to have great resolve. Jim Collins in that book, Good to Great, right? He talks about this two qualities of leaders. Those who have great resolve, right? They go out there, they're creative, they're diligent, they're, they have great ability, they have abundance, they go and do hard work. This, this talk, by the way, is not to stop and smell the roses. We are called to do a great work. But we are also called, and this is the interesting thing that Collins talks about, the great leader is also the one who has great humility, which is actually the capacity to receive. To receive what other people can tell you. To receive the criticism from your wife, from your husband, from your children, from others, and learn from it and not be offended by it. This is what creates great leaders, but it has only this ability to receive. So where does that put us? It puts us at a full matrix, right? Let me highlight three points about this matrix so we don't get confused. One is we don't want to expect more out of this matrix than it can give. And the fact is, if you think about it, most of us are all over the place. Some of us may look at our work as a job, but our leisure is contemplation. Some of us may look at our work as a vocation, but we spend most of our leisure as amusement. That's just simply the fragmentation that many of us live in. The second point I want to make very clear is there is nothing wrong with work as a job. I work for money. I've gone into my vice president of academic affairs twice in my life, and I've gotten two raises, and I'm quite happy about it. There is nothing wrong with wanting to live better. Right? There's nothing wrong with being paid according to who you are. Right? This is not the point. By the way, there's nothing wrong with a career. When someone says, you know what, we are going to give you more responsibilities because you have done great work, boy, there is nothing more satisfying when those things happen. But here's the problem. Those views of work are too small for the human spirit. God has a hard time acting in the job or the career dimension which is why we're called to look at our work as a vocation. Augustine captures this profoundly when he says in the Confessions, he says, the house of my soul is too small for you to come to it. May it be enlarged by you. What the church is always attempting to get to us is saying, we are living small worlds. We've created a small world. And the wisdom of the church and the wisdom of the gospels is saying, whoa, there's a bigger world out there. Look at this bigger world. And lastly, the point, third point, is the question of integrity. This is an overused word, particularly within business circles. And too often, business people will often claim it in a glib and cheap way. I have integrity as though I am the author of my integrity. That's not real integrity. Integrity is a lifelong project, and while we are called to cooperate with it, we can never be the full authors of it, because we will screw it up. And we often do it through this problem of the divided life, which is why we always have to depend upon the deep receptivity of God's graces that will give us something that we can't create ourselves. And thus, it gets us at the thesis. If we do not get leisure right, if we do not get God's grace right, and we don't have the capacity and take the time in which to receive it, it will be very difficult for us to begin to understand our businesses in the way that God wants it to be understood. Thank you very much.